Welcome back. This is uh, Methods of Bible Study. Once again, my name is Dave. It hasn't changed since I saw you last, but uh, I want to tell you a little bit more about me so you get a chance to know who your professor is. I told you last week some of the things I love. The one thing that I didn't share is I love movies. My wife and I are movie junkies. We probably have 200 DVDs and Blu-rays at home. We go to the movies all the time. It's probably one of our favorite things to do as a family is all get on this one big couch, cuddle, eat popcorn, and watch movies. And in fact, we have this thing at my house that my kids laugh at because when we go to the movies, we go early. We're one of those kind of families that we get there super early because there is a perfect spot in the theater. I don't know if you realize that, but it's you know there's a perfect location so that the screen is just big enough to fill your peripheral vision. The sound is perfect. You know, Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory is correct. There was a perfect spot in the theater. But not only is that one of the reasons we go there early, but the other reason we go there early be is because I want to see the previews. Now, I realize previews have gone overboard, and now there's like a half hour of commercials <laughs> now. But the reality is I love seeing what's coming out. I'm one of those kind of people that I look at the movie, and whether it's my son or with me or my wife that's with me, I will actually say, we're seeing that or forget that, or we'll even say that's a DVD movie, you know? And we'll actually think about what movies we're going to next. And no, you're not the only one that does that. Yes, there are some other people that do it, and I love that. But I gotta tell you my other pet peeve now, okay? This is me kind of confessing a little bit here. One of my greatest pet peeves is when the trailer shows all the good stuff. You know, like it's all the funny jokes, it's all the good stunts, and so when you go and you spend your money to watch the movie for real, it's like 95 minutes of boredom and the 30 seconds of funny. And I'm that's, I get so bummed at that. And I, and I actually have developed some theories of what movies we're going to see. And I want to just ask you, and I know we're being filmed, but I want you to just talk out loud with me. What are some ways that when you're looking at the trailer and you think about what movie you're going to go see and spend your hard-earned money on, how do you know you could trust that movie trailer? What are some things that you take into consideration and say, yes, I can trust that, I'm going to go see that? What are some of the things you listen to or consider? Just shout it out loud. Go ahead. Okay, so the reviews. Excellent. So there are people that review movies for a living. They should have a better understanding of what a good movie is, and therefore you're like, okay, it got good reviews. Good. Someone else. The plot, so in other words, the storyline seems appealing, okay? So when you're looking at that trailer, it's an intriguing story. Not overdone, not boring. Good. Something else. Good. It's just a source that I trust, like a good um, series in itself. Okay, so maybe it's, it's the writer or the actor or the director. So someone that you know their work, and therefore you're like, oh, man, I, I see all of those guys' movies. I mean, I have a few of those kind of characters that anything that um, Tommy Lee Jones makes, I want to go see, you know? I mean, there's just certain things, that there's certain characters I just love watching their stuff. Good. Anybody else have an idea of how you go see something? Does anybody ever go to a website like moviepooper.com to see what they say about the ending. I mean, there's a certain times that I don't care about being surprised by the story. I just want to know, how is this going to end? Is this a good, is it worth my time? So sometimes we can like go, and I realize that's maybe cheating for some of you, but there are websites that are spoilers that tell me, hey, you know what? This is not going to be a real cheesy story because here's what takes place in the story. I don't know if anybody does that. Maybe I'm just kind of the weird one that likes to kind of sometimes know the ending ahead of time. Well, what I want you to see is how these often relate to how we really kind of trust the Bible. And there's maybe one more we didn't talk about. For example, there are people in the, who have read the Bible and studied the Bible and have made their life out of that, and they're Bible scholars, and because of the research that they have done, I can trust the Bible a little bit more because they're like, man, they're just dialed in and knowing what's, what's real. You know, um, the character of God, kind of like you, we look at these different people and we know their work and we can trust their work. Well, this is God's inspired word. Because I can trust God's character, I have a little more trust that the Bible is something that's worth me really knowing and, and understanding his authority. You know, there are other people that um, we didn't kind of list up here. Um, have any, any of you ever talked to a friend 
And maybe a friend said, man, this movie was amazing. And you had no intention of seeing that movie. But because a friend said, this movie is amazing, you wouldn't saw the movie. You may have a friend recommend it. Yeah, I, I actually listen to my friends more than I listen to the people who review movies. Because usually, if, if the reviewers like the movie, I won't. My, my standards of movies are pretty low. I just want to have fun. You know, I want to laugh. I don't care about the artistic quality, you know, but, you know, so, but I listened to my friends. Well, the same thing happened. There were eyewitnesses of Christ and of all the other events of history. And these eyewitnesses often paid the price of kind of claiming that to be true with their lives. And so I can trust the eyewitnesses. And, and one last kind of correlation, you know what, there is a ton of prophecies in the Old Testament that were revealed and fulfilled in the New Testament, and those prophecies fulfilled gives me greater confidence and kind of trusting the Bible. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be studying today for the next few minutes together why we can trust the Bible. If we're going to spend our lives studying this and obeying this and memorizing this, this needs to be more than just some really good book that gets you excited and you can kind of take or leave. This needs to be rock solid trustworthy. Well, I had some friends that put together a small video about why they trust the Bible. And I want to show this to you right now, and then we'll talk about some of the deeper ideas. Hi, I'm Mike. Hi, my name is Shauna. Hi, I'm Nathan, and this is why I trust the Bible. Hi, I'm Trisha. I'm Drew Dill. My name is Lauren. Hi, my name is Hannah, and this is why I trust the Bible. And this is why I trust the Bible. And this is why I trust the Bible. This is why I trust the Bible. This is why I trust the Bible. I trust the Bible because people like Isaiah were solid in half for it. It's the inspired word of God, and I find that it has never failed me. And the more and more I grow as a Christian, I realize the truth. I trust the Bible because I haven't been able to prove it wrong. And I trust the Bible because not only is it God's Word given to us, but every time I read it, my heart opens and my soul opens and everything inside me tells me that it's good and it's real. I trust the Bible because it says that it's God-breathed, and I'm going to trust the God who sent His Son to die, live, and resurrect for me. And the reason I trust the Bible is because Jesus tells me to. And as I look at the scriptures, everything makes sense. It points to a solution and it points to the root of the problem, which was our sin. Well, I trust in the Bible because first of all, of all the eyewitness accounts that are in the Bible, and I see them over and over again saying the same exact thing about Christ. I trust the Bible because of the facts and the truth of the prophecies from the Old Testament confirming it true, and also because the Holy Spirit um, convicts in my heart what I believe to be true, and it's shown and lived out in my life, the truths of the Bible, and so confirmed daily that the truths of it are real and true. I trust the Bible because of all the archaeological evidences, such as when Sir William Ramsey confirmed many people and places in the book of Luke. Hi, my name is Jeremy. I trust the Bible because it is God's spoken word. I trust the Bible because it is purely God-breathed, and um, God is perfect and just and always present. I trust the Bible because the more I read it, um, the more joy my heart gets filled with. And uh, the more I read it, I realize that uh, I can apply it to my everyday life. And there's never been anything that's affected my everyday life like the Bible has. And one of the reasons why I trust the Bible is because it is without contradiction. I trust the Bible because it is God breathed and the Holy Spirit has done work in my heart. And so I trust the Bible because it doesn't tell me what I want to hear, it tells me what I need to hear. I trust the Bible because it's brought me to Jesus. That's why I trust the Bible. That is why I trust in the Bible. And that's why I trust the Bible. And that's why I trust the Bible. That's why I trust the Bible. And that's why I trust the Bible. That's why I trust the Bible. And that's why I trust the Bible. That's why I trust the Bible. All right, well, they, they named a number of the same reasons we just listed on the board right there, plus a few more. And the reality is maybe one of these on its own is, okay, that's nice. You can say about a lot of different religious writings. But you take the whole weight of it, and you start to say there's something special about this. And I want to highlight two of the many reasons that were maybe listed 
in that video and kind of how we already listed on the far left over there of two reasons why I think we really can trust the Bible. And these are probably two more of the complex reasons. So that's why I wanted to kind of mention these things like archaeology and eyewitnesses, the, you know, the character of God and this is revealed to be and claimed to be the, the word of God. Those are good, and other theologians are going to discuss those probably in deeper detail. But I wanted to highlight two, because we have a shorter time to go. The first one is the role the Old Testament has played in forming the New Testament. And what we're specifically looking at here are our prophecies. See, the reality is Jesus based his life and the foundations of his teachings upon the Old Testament. He actually operated kind of like a Jewish rabbi, completely built upon the scriptures like Isaiah. See, the reason I can trust the answer in the Bible is because it's not just a message that started with Jesus, but it's a credible message that God spoke in the past and fulfilled in Jesus and continued to proclaim in Jesus. In fact, take your Bibles that you have with you. I know you all brought them today. So take your Bibles. Look at Luke chapter 4. I think it's important. We always come back to look at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It lets us know a lot about how he orchestrated his life and his teachings. So in Luke chapter 4, the, the, the background or the context is Jesus made it his custom to get together with God's people for worship on the Sabbath. And there they would actually read the word. And so it was kind of like a, the normal or usual order of service in a synagogue began with an opening prayer and praise and then reading from the law and then reading from the prophets and then a sermon. And Usually the sermon was brought, if it wasn't from the rabbi of that synagogue, it was from a guest lecturer, in other words, some famous visitor. Well, Jesus was that learned visitor that day. When Jesus came, like, wow, Jesus is here, let's listen to him, because he, they, he was thought of more as a Jewish rabbi at this part. And since this synagogue in Luke chapter 4 is actually in Nazareth, it's most likely that Jesus attended here as a boy. So think about it, it's kind of like if you went back home and you're fresh from your Biola experience, and you have so much Bible knowledge just spilling out your ears because of your time at Biola, the, the, the church looks at you and says, you know what, we want to hear from you today. What have you learned about God at Biola? Well, that's kind of what took place in the synagogue, that Jesus was the one that was allowed to kind of select the scripture, and he was going to expound upon the scripture. And so what's amazing, it says to us in Luke chapter 4 now, verse 17, he asks for the prophet Isaiah. Here's what it says. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. And he quotes from Isaiah 61 here. All right. So it's a longer um, prophecy, but he quotes this one specific part. Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 2. And he says this. The spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, this is his message, his sermon. Here's what he said. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, Isaiah 61 actually continues. This was a prophecy about the Messiah. But Jesus stopped reading about how Isaiah is going to show us the nature of a prophecy. In other words, there's a, a comma that continues in Isaiah 61 that goes on to talk about what's going to take place at Jesus' return when he establishes his physical kingdom on earth. But Jesus stopped to say, look, I'm come today to establish... The reign of God in a spiritual way. And that comma in Isaiah 61 is like a 2,000 year old pause. It's like, all right, it's going to go on for a long time. But right here, right now, I'm the one that Isaiah wrote of. Well, you can read back in Luke chapter 4, the people are looking at Jesus and are going, uh, wait a minute, we know this kid. He came to the synagogue. That's Joseph's son. And they get all upset about that. But what we're seeing, what Jesus is saying is... The Old Testament prophecies that were already taken for granted by the Jews as being the authoritative word of God, that this is God's authority inspired by God. Well, that truth that you already believe in, I'm fulfilling right here, right now in your presence. And the Jews didn't like that, but that's a whole other sermon. And see, the reality is this, that, that not only did Jesus base his life on the Holy Scriptures, because of that, 
really they're, they show to be trustworthy. Not just like, hey, these are good thoughts, but trustworthy to be obeyed. Because Jesus described his relationship to the prophets and the law, which form the Old Testament, as vital. Look at Matthew with me real quick, all right? Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Now remember, Jesus was kind of like started his ministry um, as almost like a Jewish rabbi, you know, teaching about the law and going around and, and preaching to people. But he actually started to let the people know, you've kind of, kind of missed it. You've kind of realized that this is not all that God wanted for us. And so a lot of times we think, well, Jesus was the anti-religious establishment, that he came to kind of say to the Jews, you've got it wrong, and to give them a whole brand new way of relating to God. And he gave us the new covenant. But the reality is he didn't do away with the Old Testament. It wasn't like he said, hey, you know what? The Old Testament, you no longer need it. No, he, he looked at the Old Testament as essential to his ministry. And Matthew chapter 5 is a Sermon on the Mount. And he's basically giving us the foundation of everything he's going to do. And in fact, if you go back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, you see that the whole purpose of his teaching was to tell people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. He says, look, I'm now fulfilling those, all those prophecies. But when it comes to people saying, well, Jesus says a new way, therefore we don't have to listen to the Old Testament law or prophets. Jesus says, no. Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. He says, do not think... I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor at the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of these least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands, what? The Old Testament law and prophets teaches the, these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Think about that. He didn't come to destroy it. He came to fulfill it. See, that's what we want you to get, that we can trust the Bible because the fulfillment of those prophecies, those predictions, provide certain and reliable testimony of the truth of scriptures. In fact, what's amazing, when you think about all the things that Jesus came to fulfill, there's actually 332 distinct Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. Okay, now... A Bible scholar, like we talk, we can trust them. They have gone back, they've identified these, they've looked back at the, other, at the New Testament scriptures and said, look where Jesus fulfilled this. this. Let me just give you a sampling, okay? Micah 5, 2 talks about that Bethlehem will be his birthplace. 700 years later, the wise men found Jesus in Bethlehem after first seeking their new king in the capital. They're thinking the king is going to be in Jerusalem. But no, when they consulted the prophets, they realize that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. And in Matthew chapter 2, we have the recording of that's where the wise men found him. Isaiah 53 says that he, takes up, he took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. And the Gospel of Matthew is filled with scripture, quoting not only that specific passage in Isaiah 53, but also just detailing the work of Jesus. And oftentimes Matthew, who was written, written to the Jews, would say, this was done to fulfill in other words, Jesus did these miracles, he did this healing to fulfill what the prophet Isaiah had already said. In fact, Isaiah 53 goes on to give us a prophecy about Jesus' attitude towards his accuser at his death and gives information about his burial. In fact, Isaiah 53 records prophecies that the Messiah would be silent at his trial and his death. And in Matthew 27, the government, governor Pilate remarked at Jesus' silence when his accusers brought all these accusations and then later, to fulfill that same prophecy, ordered his body be placed in the tomb of a, another man, a rich man. That's what, exactly what takes place in Matthew 27. Psalm 16 is a prediction, a prophecy about Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And actually, Jesus himself would point out he would arise. In other words, Jesus himself gave a prophecy in Matthew 16, 21, when he talked about one day, I too will be dead for three days and come back to life. And that's the foundation with our whole faith is based. It is recognized by historians. It cannot be explained away by his enemies, even though they tried. They tried to say, where's the body? They couldn't find it because Jesus had arose. So I want you to think about this. Jesus knew he was God, and he had to prove his identity and the reliability of the Bible. And so he did it by giving his own prophecies, and he fulfilled them, and he fulfilled the Old Testament. Now, 
What I want you to get is it's the combination of these different ideas that makes the reliability of the Bible secure. Just if you take the idea of prophecy alone, think about this. There's a professor named Peter Stoner, and he calculated the probability of any one man fulfilling eight of these prophecies. All right? So one guy, eight of the 332, one guy fulfilling all eight is one, and I have no idea what that number is. It's 10 to the 17th power. All right? That's a huge number. And to kind of give you some perspective of how big that number is, if you take a silver dollar, a small silver dollar, all right? If you take a silver dollar and you take a whole bunch of them, that number, if you take all those silver dollars, it would cover the state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars. That's how big that number is. One in that big of a number. Meaning, dude, the reliability of this is pretty certain. In fact, if you consider 48 prophecies, the odds of one man fulfilling all 48 is one to 10 to the 157th power. My point is this. You can't imagine a number that big or a probability that small. The Bible is trustworthy. And that's why over and over again, Matthew, in writing of the accounts of Jesus, says this was to fulfill the prophecies of what Jesus did because it gives us great confidence in knowing who Jesus is because we can trust, wow, he fulfilled those prophecies that were told about him. So I can not only trust Jesus is the Messiah, but I can trust the word of God that was given so many centuries ago and that continues to live today for us. So that's the first reason why I have confidence in the Bible. The second reason I can have confidence in the Bible is because how the Bible was written from God through others to me. And it really is, I'm talking about here about the role of the canon. See, there are a lot of people that are going to really question, can you trust the Bible that you have? Maybe God did speak to some person thousands of years ago, but can you trust that's actually what you're reading today? And so I want to talk a little bit about the idea of, of the canon and how we receive the canon, how we can trust what we have in our hands that was given to us as reliable. And it starts with inspiration. You heard in the video, you heard it in scripture, that all word is God breathed. It's God, it comes from God. This isn't just our own idea. And that's really kind of the, the passage of 2 Timothy 3.16, when it says all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach what is true and good, and, and, kind of, and rebuke, and correct, and train for righteousness. And so the idea is that God, through the Holy Spirit, used 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years to communicate what he wanted. And that word inspire in the Greek means to breathe or to blow into. So it's the idea that God is giving these men what he wanted, nothing more, nothing less. But I want to give you a definition that R.C. Sproul talked about. And I'll put this PowerPoint on Blackboard so you don't have to write all this down. But he basically said this, The Holy Spirit guided the human authors so that their words would be nothing less than the Word of God. How God superintended the original writings of the Bible is not known. But inspiration, now listen to this, inspiration does not mean that God dictated his message to, the Holy, to those who wrote the Bible. Rather, the Holy Spirit communicated through the human writers the very words of God. So the idea that I want you to kind of grasp is if we lived thousands of years ago and God supernaturally selected Carlo to, to kind of share his message for us, it'd be like, because God knows Carlo, right? He knows Carlo's personality. He knows his abilities. He knows the way he would write. And he's saying, you know what? I want something to be communicated and he will say it exactly the way I want it. That's kind of what he did with David, right? David was, um, he was an amazing young dude. He was a, a, a musician. He was an athlete. He could throw a slingshot straight, right? He was a warrior. He was a leader. And he goes, David will communicate exactly what I want. There was only a few times that God actually dictated to someone what he wanted them to say. Moses was one of those, right? When the Ten Commandments, he kind of took a chisel. He, t he spelled it exactly what he wanted. But for the most part, Inspiration means God selected human people to write down his very words that we might have this truth. And the result was the personalities of the authors came through, catch this now, without changing God's message one bit. How they said it was exactly how God always wanted it to be said. So you, you start with inspiration. But that's kind of, what, I think, an important idea that God spoke to people. And I want you to kind of think with me for a little bit about how the Bible became a reality. Because when Jesus walked on the earth in 30 AD, 
all right? He passed his stories along orally, right? He, you know, he basically took, you know, and people kind of gather around him and, and he would just teach them. And think about it. They didn't have, you know, texting back then. They didn't have TV. They didn't have your iPad. And so what did you do at night? You sat around a campfire and you told stories and you told the same story over and over and over. And it's called oral tradition. And the idea that because that story was told so often, you knew it by memory. And you could just repeat it by memory. And that's what Jesus did. He passed his teaching and his stories along orally. And so from the very beginning, in the 30 to 50s, when the church was just getting started, they recognized three sources of authority, or three streams of authority. The first, like we already talked about, was Jewish scriptures. In other words, the Old Testament, as you have today, is exactly what they had back then. And those are the books, those prophecies, that have, and the law that they claim to be, this is God's authoritative word. There was no doubt about that. But they also listened to the teachings of Jesus, right? Remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, they're hearing Jesus teach, and at the end they go, what is this new authority that you're teaching us with? In other words, they said, you, we thought you, of you as just as a rabbi, but you're giving us some brand new ideas. Wow, what authority you're teaching us. So the teachings of Jesus were taken as you're speaking to us the words of God. Um, this is another kind of a thought. John chapter 6, you know, Jesus gives some very difficult words about what it means to follow him. And most of the people who are just into Jesus as a fad left. And the disciples stayed. And Jesus says, don't you want to leave as well? And they say, to where will we go? For you have the words of eternal life. The reality is that Jesus' teachings, even orally, were seen as authoritative of God. And then lastly, as we see in the book of Acts chapter 2, the early church gathered around the apostles, these men that spent so much time with Jesus, and they said, tell us again what Jesus said. And they would repeat orally the same things they've heard. So we see these three streams that were repeated orally. But in the 50 to 70 ADs, as, some of the, as the church begins to expand and, and other things take place, we see that the first written documents from the apostles are, are kind of written out. That's when we have a lot of our epistles and some of the gospels are written during this time. And at this point, it was really self-authentication of the author. In other words, by the author putting his name on, on the letter, they would kind of know who that author was because he was still alive and he kind of walked. Because of who that person was, we knew we could trust him. So the authority of these writings, listen to this carefully, was not transferred back onto these documents at a later time. The original recipients understood the authority conferred upon those written documents by the author or the apostle. So in other words, it was received by the original uh, um, audience, those original churches, as God's inspired word. Not like, hey, 300 years later, some people got together and said, you know what, we're going we're to claim these to be of God. No, those original churches received them as the word of God. Well, persecution entered the church in 70 to 90 AD, and the Jewish Christians were scattered, and they took their message, both oral and written, with them. And it was during this period of time that many of the apostles were martyred. In fact, John was probably the only one left, and he wrote the Gospel of John, and 1 John, and 3 John, through 3 John, and Revelation during this time. And all of a sudden, because the, the oral tradition was starting to die out, because the original people weren't there to repeat it, the importance of written documents becomes very recognizable. In other words, we need to hold on to these things, these, these letters. And they started to collect them. So that by 90 to 150 AD, you started to see a new technology, not iPads, you know, not digital, but the, what was called the codex or the bound book. See, before that, letters were kind of sitting by scroll and parchment. But now for the first time, you're able to kind of combine these parchments together so you could actually have a book. So it was easy to collect these different writings, so you could kind of pass them around, and so you started having the Gospels grouped together, and different uh, uh, writings of Paul together, and you started, you, during this time, they started to be circulated, so you could read all these letters at one time that were already recognized by the original audience as being authoritative. Well, history continues to grow on us, and by 150 AD to 200 AD, the New Testament collection of 27 books was first published sometime in the middle of that second century. And by the end of that second century, you had four Gospels, the 13 letters of Paul, 1 Peter, and 1 John. They were fully accepted as God's inspired word. Now, this is important because even the early church fathers had to defend God's word from attacks. A couple of years ago, in um, National Geographic, they came out with this whole big idea about the Gospel of Judas. And it was like, oh my goodness, for the very first time, there's another book 
about something about Jesus and it's contradictory and it's like, oh my goodness, is this the very first time we've wrestled with this? And no, even the early church fathers had to stand up against Gnosticism and say, you know what, this is bogus writing. So it's not, this is not brand new information. Even in the early hundreds, the early church said, no, this is of God, not that. And they started to recognize and defend the authority of God's word in the collection that they had. And then lastly, in the 200 and 300s, you start to see some of these books that have some, some debate about them. Hebrews, we don't know who the author is. And so for a long time, it wasn't accepted as being inspired by God. James, 2 Peter, Jude, 2 and 3 John. But by the, you know, the 200 and 300s, those were widely accepted. And it wasn't until Constantine made Christianity the official religion, he actually financed the copying of 50 copies of what they call the sacred scripture. So that was when you started to see in mass production the first publication of the Bible. Why did I tell you about this? Well, because it's part of how we can trust the Bible. The canonicity is really important. And what that means, the word canon, actually is a word that means read, okay? Like ruler, to, to measure. In other words, the idea of canon is their way of measuring the authority in some word uh, that was written, say this, this word really measures up as the word of God. So they had some rules as they looked at this, as the early churches came together and they said, okay, we're going to recognize these are the official inspired words of God and not those. So they had some checkpoints and they asked themselves, does it speak with God's authority? Going all the way back to the original audience, does this speak with God's authority? And and do we know who wrote this? Was it written by a man of God, one of the apostles, speaking to us as a prophet of God? So they looked at the impact that it has, as well as the author. Um, when it kind of, when you read this, does it have the authentic stamp of God? Does it have any contradictions? Does it kind of go against some of the things we already know to be true about what Jesus said? Does this power impact us with the power of God? Think about it. In that video, we didn't necessarily list it on our board here, but some of my students said, you know, when I read God's word, my soul comes alive. The Holy Spirit speaks to me. It changes me. Well, does it have that power of, to impact our lives? And lastly, did the original audience accept it as being the actual word of God? So these are questions that were asked. There are some books that are written that are like they had no clue who the author was. And we definitely knew it wasn't, you know, like Thomas. You know, there's a gospel of Thomas that floats out there. They had some bizarre stories of Jesus when he was a young child. And the church knew this isn't from Thomas and this is not what Jesus did. And they rejected it being authoritative of God. Here's the key thought. Write this down. The canon councils did not declare a book to be from God. They simply recognized the divine authority that was already there. Remember, canon means to measure. It doesn't make something six foot tall. I could say, hey, you know, I'm going to measure myself to be six eight. I'm still five eight, right? No matter what my measurement is, the reality is I'm five eight. That's what the canons did. They simply recognize the divine authority. They did not declare a book to be from God. And we've got to remember that. It's a huge, huge difference. So some people might say, well, Dave, it's great. God spoke and people wrote down. And, and yes, in the very beginning, because it was so close to when Jesus lived, and the apostles lived, that probably was what they had. But how do you know? How can you trust the words right in front of you? Can't things get lost? Can't things be changed? And that really is the issue of transmission. All right? Basically, it's that link from God to us, that last piece of how do we have it? Because they didn't have Xerox back then. And basically, the scriptures had to be copied and translated and recopied and retranslated. And that process continued. And so accuracy is essential. Well, basically, they have some measurements of how they can know that there are reliable standards in, in the manuscripts. Okay? And so this is, this is true for all ancient manuscripts. This is not just true for the Bible. So, for example, Plato's Republic. It's a book you might have had to read. You might have to read it here in college. Well, they basically said, okay, do we know who the author is, and do we know when it, that book was written? Well, we know when Plato lived. We don't know when he wrote the book, or the, the Republic, but we know that he kind of lived somewhere between 427 and 347 B.C. All right, there, okay, it's somewhere in that ballpark. When's the earliest copy of Plato's Republic? 
In other words, copies that match and are consistent. The earliest copy that's consistent is from 900 AD, and there's seven copies at, of that, that variety. That's a 1,200-year gap and only seven copies. And yet, I can guarantee you, if you have to read Plato's Republic, and you go to your professor and you say, you know what, um, I don't think we can trust the reliability of this is really Plato. I don't think we can trust the words that he has to say because we don't know really who wrote it. So I don't think I should have to write a paper on this. Your professor's not going to care about that. They're going to say, no, we trust this is Plato's Republic. Deal with it. All right? Go on. Homer's Iliad. There's even a question about, did Homer really write this poem? You know, there's a lot of debate. Is it really of Homer or not? And, and it's written somewhere around 850 BC. And the earliest copies we have, now we have a lot more copies of this, which is really good, but the earliest copy is from 1000 AD. So that's an 1800-year gap. Don't know the author, 100%. Bigger gap, but more copies. Homer's Iliad, valid, read it. Our New Testament, go back to that codex, that idea, that the, the collection of what we have together. That Remember, that was collected, it started in the four, 400 when it was written. The final writing of it was around 100 AD with John. Our earliest copy, remember that codex, is 125 AD. At worst, you know, it's an 85-year gap. At best, it's only a 25-year gap. One lifetime. Meaning, someone could double check and say, wait a minute, I was alive when Jesus was there. I was alive when John spoke. This isn't real. A lifetime. We have 24,000 plus copies from that era. I won't even get into like the Dead Sea Scrolls to, prove, to kind of support Isaiah. My point is this. When you want to talk about transmission of ancient documents, our Bible far exceeds anything else out there. Well, you take... Things like prophecies fulfilled, and you take things like how we could trust the way the Bible came to us in the canon, and you take all the other things we didn't even talk about, and when I give you assignments to read your Bible, you can go to it banking. This is God's inspired word, infallible, inerrant, ready to be followed and lived by. All right? Let's pray, and then we'll be done. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.